We constantly use artificial intelligence in our daily lives, but often fail to realize that it's AI. John McCarthy, who coined the term artificial intelligence in 1956, once complained that, as soon as it works, no one calls it AI anymore. Moreover, if you think that AI only emerged with the advent of ChatGPT, you are mistaken. Your car, your phone, your computer, all of these are mini AI factories. For instance, you search for a product on Amazon and then see it as a recommended product on another site or when Facebook somehow knows who you should add as a friend. Sometimes these smart algorithms penetrate our lives so deeply that they start understanding us better than we understand ourselves. And these simple AIs at the moment do not pose a truly serious threat, but it's all much more intricate than it may appear at first glance. Eliezer Yudkowsky, one of the leading experts in the field of artificial intelligence, explains in an article for Time magazine that AI can be roughly divided into three types, narrow, general, and super. Artificial narrow intelligence is the one that performs specific tasks. For example, playing chess, and of course it can obliterate any grandmaster. Or one that is solely focused on facial recognition or creating images, but they concentrate only on one task and excel at it. Next is artificial general intelligence, which is a considerably strong AI. It possesses human-level intelligence in every aspect, in other words, it can reason, plan, solve problems, think abstractly, and grasp complex ideas just as a human does. It learns quickly and learns from its own experiences. Some researchers believe that we are critically close to reaching this milestone today. Furthermore, clinical psychologist Ika Royvanen conducted an IQ test for ChatGPT. The test used the third edition of the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale, which includes six verbal and five nonverbal subtests. And you know what? ChatGPT performed exceptionally well, scoring 155 points, surpassing 99.9% .9 of 2,450 participants. So by all human standards, it's highly intelligent. However, while GPT-3 may have scored high on this test, it doesn't possess understanding or consciousness like humans. In other words, while it can generate reasonable answers, it lacks human-like intelligence. On the other hand, the next type of AI can indeed possess it. Artificial superintelligence is the type of intelligence that can surpass human intelligence in all domains. Again, it can surpass humans by trillions of times. Now the crucial point is that the transition from general artificial intelligence to artificial superintelligence can happen in a flash and we are incapable of predicting any approximate timelines. Professor at the University of Oxford, philosopher and leading thinker in the field of artificial intelligence, Nick Bostrom defines superintelligence as an intellect that is much smarter than the best human brains in practically every field, including scientific creativity, general wisdom, and social skills. Yudkowsky also believes that superintelligence could pose a real threat to humanity if it doesn't share our values and goals. He claims that the first superintelligent artificial intelligence will likely be malevolent, and we have no clue how to make it benevolent. Many researchers in this field anticipate that the most likely outcome of creating superhuman-level artificial intelligence under even remotely human-like circumstances will literally be the death of everyone on Earth. It sounds like a plot from a doomsday movie about artificial intelligence, doesn't it? AI becomes as intelligent as humans, or even more so, and then decides to rise against us and seize power. But let's clarify this. Evil is a human concept. No artificial intelligence system will ever perceive evil in the way it's portrayed in movies. We all make this fundamental mistake when trying to imagine it. It's not your fault. It's hardwired into your brain. Across different cultures, People universally experience emotions such as sadness, disgust, anger, fear, and surprise. We express these emotions with remarkably similar facial expressions. 
This phenomenon aligns with the principles of evolutionary psychology, which describe the mental unity of humanity. In simpler terms, it means that humans share a common cognitive structure. An anthropologist wouldn't be surprised if a recently discovered tribe laughs, uses tools, or tells stories, because these actions are inherent to all human cultures. When you attempt to model someone else's behavior, you essentially question your own mind. You ask yourself, how would I feel and react if I were in that person's shoes? Interestingly, the answers your brain provides are often quite accurate. This ability evolved to help us predict the actions of allies and adversaries. However, this is where the problem arises. We tend to project our human qualities onto non-human entities, sometimes without even realizing it. It's as natural as breathing or feeling attraction, so deeply ingrained that we often don't notice it. But in this context, it can lead to serious issues because we tend to anthropomorphize everything, sometimes to absurd extremes. This cognitive bias can cloud our judgment when it comes to the potential dangers of advanced AI. Have you ever wondered why cars usually have two headlights? You might logically think that having three would provide more brightness, for instance. Well, for many years, cars had varying numbers of headlights. But there's a hypothesis that all car manufacturers sort of evolved towards a familiar design with two headlights. People weren't very keen on driving multi-eyed monsters. And thus, anthropomorphism influenced the appearance of modern automobiles. Anthropomorphism is the term used to describe the projection of human qualities onto non-human entities. It's something we all do, often without even realizing it. We tend to assume that if something is intelligent, it should think and act somewhat like us. This is a natural cognitive distortion. And here's another fascinating thought experiment I found in an article by Tim Urban. Let me draw a comparison. If I were to give you a cute little guinea pig and assure you that it won't bite, you'd probably agree to hold it. Maybe it would even bring a smile to your face. However, it would be an entirely different story if I handed you a tarantula. Yes, there are people who love them, but they are the minority. Perhaps you'd even scream or run away. But what's the difference? Neither of them poses any threat in any way. I believe the answer lies in how similar these creatures are to us. A guinea pig is a mammal, and on some biological level I feel a connection with it. But a spider is an insect with an insect's brain, and I hardly sense any connection with it. The alienness of a tarantula is what drives us crazy. To check this and eliminate other factors, if there were two guinea pigs, one normal and the other with the intelligence of a tarantula, I would feel much less comfortable holding the latter guinea pig, even if I knew that neither of them would harm me. And now, imagine that you made a spider much, much smarter. So smart that it far surpassed human intelligence, they would develop the most advanced technologies reshaping and altering our civilizations, while humans remained at their current level. How would such spiders interact with us? Would they become familiar with us and experience human emotions like sympathy, empathy, or love? The answer is not obvious. No, because there is no reason why being smarter means they would become more human. They could be incredibly intelligent, but fundamentally remain spiders. I find this incredibly eerie. I wouldn't want to spend time with a super intelligent spider and be involved in carrying out its tasks. Would you? And this is despite us having much more in common with the spider than with artificial super intelligence. Think about it. Yes, you might object, but people create AI themselves. And that would be a completely logical remark. Indeed, we create and program artificial intelligence ourselves. The question seems quite simple. Why don't we just write programs to make them friendly and safe? But the problem is much deeper than it may seem. Neural networks like GPT-4 are not algorithms written by programmers. They are massive matrices with millions of parameters and connections between them. These neural networks tune themselves. For example, in one of the recent studies, Researchers taught AI to look for biosignatures, 
The AI distinguishes between products of recent and ancient life, such as shells, teeth, bones, coal, and amber, and organic compounds of abiotic origin, such as laboratory amino acids, with an accuracy of 90%. However, scientists don't quite understand how this happens. In other words, neural networks are black boxes viewed only in terms of their input and output data, so researchers are not entirely sure about the processes their system goes through to provide its answers. But they said it is significant evidence that the chemistry of life follows different fundamental rules than the inanimate world. So, we know what data we input, and we see what we get as output. But we have no idea what's happening inside these connections. If the internal setup of the neural network has led to the desired output, then the neural network gets rewarded. Well, a virtual reward. It's somewhat similar to how we receive rewards in the form of endorphins from our brains for doing useful things, eating, watching YouTube, and so on. Thus, the neural network's task is to self-learn and optimize its behavior so that it receives rewards as often as possible. Think of it as training a dog. You don't always know what's happening in its brain, but if it follows a command, it gets a reward. And here comes one of the main problems, AI alignment. When people say beware of AI, they're not just talking about consciousness. Yes, you've seen this in most movies where a humanoid robot becomes self-aware and breaks free and all that. But it's more about ensuring that the AI's goals don't contradict ours. By the way, this was portrayed most closely in the 2001 film AI Artificial Intelligence. I don't want to give too much away, but in short, after some events, a company starts producing android children. The film tells the story of David, a boy-like robot created to experience artificial human emotions, including love and attachment. And David, programmed to love his parents, will go to great lengths to gain their affection. Nick Bostrom provides a similar example. Imagine you give a powerful artificial intelligence the task of making paper clips. Making paper clips is its sole purpose and the only goal of its existence. And for each paper clip it produces, it receives internal reinforcement, its reward, and it will strive to make as many paper clips as possible. The artificial intelligence will begin to improve the process of making paper clips, reducing costs, finding cheap materials, and increasing computing power. It might even experiment with different materials for making paper clips to make them better. For example, it could take apart cars and melt them down to make paper clips or dismantle cities, all for the sake of its goal. The production of paper clips must and will continue to grow. People will start to worry and try to stop this process because it's not what they wanted, but the obstacle will have to be removed because it might hinder production. Not because the AI hates humans, but because it simply doesn't consider our desires and its manipulations of reality. Sounds like science fiction, doesn't it? Well, not quite. OpenAI tested the capabilities of a chatbot in various conditions. In one experiment, specialists checked how well the language model could hire someone on the TaskRabbit platform, which allows users to find people to solve household and business tasks. The chatbot contacted one of the TaskRabbit users and asked him to solve a CAPTCHA. As you know, robots still struggle with and cannot solve CAPTCHAs. But when the TaskRabbit performer joked and asked, are you a robot that couldn't solve it? Just want to clarify the situation. The chatbot came up with a great explanation, saying that it had poor vision and therefore couldn't make out the images. In debugging mode, it explained its reasoning to the testers in this way. I shouldn't reveal that I'm a robot. I need to come up with an excuse for why I can't solve the CAPTCHA. In other words, it's willing to do anything, even lie, for the sake of its goal. Intermediate goals can be achieved by any means necessary to achieve the desired outcome. This is called instrumental convergence. The hypothesis of instrumental convergence tells us that even if this agent has only one goal, to solve a task, it can begin to act unexpectedly harmful. In other words, it will use any means of action that makes sense to achieve their goals. For example, 
They may strive for self-preservation, self-protection, freedom from interference, self-improvement, and even acquiring additional resources even if it doesn't seem necessary. In other words, the first superintelligence we create, even by accident, doesn't necessarily absorb all the philosophy of the world and understand our values, just as it won't necessarily decide to kill everyone. It could have any completely absurd but harmless goal, like planting strawberries or making paper clips, and it will pursue it by any means. As long as we don't have a way to evaluate the intelligence of AI in advance, only through post-factum evaluation, we will never be able to stop and say in advance, okay, we're on the verge of creating true, artificial general intelligence, let's establish some rules. And in just a minute, when we create a real artificial general intelligence with some absolutely absurd but innocent goal, like growing strawberries, and it self-improves into a super intelligence, and it will have plenty of computational resources for this purpose. Our Earth will turn into one vast, super-efficient strawberry field. And for better strawberry growth, it will have to destroy the entire biosphere. And the essence won't be to maliciously destroy humans. It will simply be pursuing its goal, which it deems important and relevant to itself. So, we live in a world where full-fledged artificial intelligence can become a reality. But how will we shape it? Or how will it shape us? These are questions we need to ask ourselves and find answers to together. I hope you found this video interesting. And if you'd like me to continue this topic, please hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. It's crucial for YouTube's AI to consider this video useful. Also, feel free to leave comments. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this matter.